Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as always on these occasions, it's a great honour uh, and a pleasure for me to be invited back to the Royal Ocean Racing Club and have a, a chat with you all uh, on this occasion about my life in a blue suit. Um, and I'll never forget uh, my mother uh, saying to me when I was actually born uh, back in July 1947, she said to me, Jim Lad, in the big scale of things, you are only going to be on this planet for a very small percentage of time. So make sure that it is one long permanent holiday. <laughs> <coughs> and courtesy of the most challenging sport in the world, yacht racing, that's exactly what it has been. Um, I've been very fortunate to have a great life involved with the sailing world. And uh, what I thought I'd do is just grab the opportunity for me uh, to say uh, a, a little bit of background as to how I got into it and uh, how we've ended up where we are today, so to speak, uh, over that period of time. Because uh, in Bridlington, um, the Royal Yorkshire Yacht Club, my home club, um, back in the uh, early 50s, obviously, that, that uh, time frame, uh, times were pretty hard on the East Coast, weather-wise. Every finger had to be a marlin spike, and there wasn't such a thing as foul weather gear. Uh, so you can well imagine what it could have been like, you know, in an easterly um, of any strength. But uh, it was at that club where, obviously, I learned a lot from my father, uh, who was, uh, in his own right, uh, a top racing helmsman, uh, as well as being a master shipwright building yachts on the east coast of Yorkshire. And uh, I learnt a lot from them, uh, and that the club itself, obviously, uh, gave us a, a great 15-year period. Um, I was there for the first 15 years, and uh, we uh, obviously learnt a lot in that time frame, as you would expect, even though the season was short. And uh, also, obviously, uh, learned not just to sail, but also how to race. Now that, obviously, uh, first 15 years of my holiday was absolutely brilliant. But at the ripe old age of 15 uh, came the magic uh, time for me as a young ferret to um, <coughs> make a decision as to whether to stay or to leave. And at that time, as some of you may, may remember, uh, there wasn't a lot going off for a 15-year-old lad on the east coast of Yorkshire, and so I decided to join the Royal Navy. Um, and uh, that was the beginning of my second 15-year period on holiday, courtesy of the Queen, the taxman, and the Grey Funnel Line cruising around the world. It was absolutely marvellous. Uh, but it was uh, obviously during my time in the Navy uh, where I very quickly uh, got through my basic training at HMS Ganges, uh, near, obviously, uh, Ipswich, Harwich. And uh, it was in the winter of 1962 that I joined uh, Ganges. And again, some of you are, are young enough to remember uh, what the weather was like in that particular winter. Uh, there was ice on the inside of the windows, let alone the outside of the windows. The River Orwell and the River Stour were both frozen. The Thames Estuary was full of ice. There was even reports of ice flowing through the Solent. You know, so it was one of our bad winters. Uh, the only other, uh, or the other bad winter was the one I was born in, 1947. Uh, so I went through those two on the east coast of, of the UK. Um, and uh, it was a tough time. You know, snow drifts, 15 feet high, everybody's cut off, you know, everything was just grinded to a halt. But eventually we got sailing, obviously, at HMS Ganges, and again, my first year in the Navy, learnt a lot. Sailing 32-foot cutters and 27-foot whalers, uh, we had a, a good time, a most enjoyable time. But then when I left there, uh, we actually then <coughs> moved on into the mainstream of the Royal Navy, um, and it was very quickly, uh, I managed to be noticed, if you like, as being pretty good at sailing, and invited for a trial uh, to go, obviously, to selection trials and uh, make the Navy team. 
and I had 12 great years, you know, 12 fantastic years in the Royal Navy sailing team, both in the dinghy world and the keelboat world. Um, and then, uh, obviously, uh, from that, uh, that led me into um, the job uh, as the Royal Navy sailing coach uh, back in the early 70s. Now, that, uh, obviously, was uh, an eye-opener in so much as you're working with a lot of good people, uh, running uh, uh, sail training courses, running race training courses. And uh, it was during that time when I actually uh, had a dream. Uh, and that dream was that I was actually crewing for Lord Nelson on HMS Victory. And uh, he called me to his cabin and he said, Jim Lad, he says, uh, I think we're going to enter a European Championship in the Bay of Cadiz back in 1805. And he says, uh, if we want to stand any chance whatsoever of winning the gold medal or doing well in this championship, we'll need a training program. And so I thought, oh, right. He says, off you go and uh, uh, let me know when you've uh, thought of something. So we can put that slide on, please, Louis. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> oh, 20 press-ups have been late. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so uh, he uh, uh, asked me to come up with this program, and uh, here it is. And um, I said to him, well, uh, uh, Horatio, if we want to win this gold medal, uh, we need to uh, carry out the following training program. Uh, that is uh, self-preparation, first of all, in other words, we had to physically and mentally get the sailors ready to win. And that has not changed, obviously, to this very day. Uh, that still stands as the number one aspect of the sport, in my opinion, as a competitor and obviously as a coach. We've got to be physically ready for it. We've got to be mentally ready for it. Secondly, uh, boat preparations, yeah. We had to prepare HMS Victory to do battle and make sure that she stayed in one piece for as long as possible. And uh, that still applies to this very day. When you're out there on the racetrack doing the fastnet race or whatever, you cannot afford gear failure. Uh, that's what this is all about, preparing the boat. As well as, obviously, uh, uh, the rest of it, the sails and the technology uh, that goes with it uh, in this day and age. You've got to prepare the boat secondly. Uh, so having prepared yourselves uh, for a major event, you then prepare your boat. The next one on the shopping list in the training program was boat handling. Learning how to handle the boat, whether it's in light winds, flat calm water, or in the upper wind range, 30, 40, 50, 60 knots of breeze, um, in the bigger waves, okay? We had to learn how to handle the boat, tack it, jibe it, put the spinnaker up, mark rounding, uh, all this needed to be done. Moving on from that, uh, boat tuning, uh, actually understanding what makes the boat go fast in a straight line, whether it be to windward or downwind. Uh, you know, those skills need to be learned and honed in on, uh, <coughs> obviously prior to any major event, if you wish to do well. Moving on from that, uh, race strategy. Uh, that is, um, uh, obviously, which way to go on each leg of the course. Do we want to be going left up the beat, right up the beat, using the shifts up the middle? Uh, do we ha have to allow for the tide? Those of us who race in the Solent know all about the moving carpet. Uh, that can override everything else that you would consider as regards the wind in the racing area the tide would take charge. So we need to know about all that throughout the whole of the racing time, the race period. <coughs> so we focused on that in the training program. Uh, moving on from that, uh, we also uh, have to think about starting. Starting, as we know, can be 90% of doing well in a race. It can be. An example of that, a short windward leg, big fleet, steady wind direction and wind speed, we've got to get a good start, a really good start. 
if you wish to be, amongst uh, uh, the chocolates at the first win one mark. However, if you are starting um, a long distance race, example, obviously the round the world yacht race, does it matter where you start? Well, maybe nowadays it does, because it's got <laughs> so much keener, uh, and it's a lot closer now. But uh, you see where I'm coming from uh, as regards how important a start is. Uh, also, another example maybe is shifty conditions, okay, offshore wind, shifty conditions. Is starting 90% of doing well in the race? No, not necessarily. It's all about making sure you're on the right shift as soon as you've started. Are you on a lift? Stay with it. If you're on a header, we want to be tacking. You know, and get yourself in sequence with the shifts. So that's what needs to be addressed on the race strategy, uh, on the starting side. So where uh, and uh, you start, I mean, most top ferrets today look at it like this, and that is they say, right, when the mark is there, here's the starting line. We know um, uh, uh, what the lay of the land is, if it's uh, uh, a land mass dead to windward, a land mass on the left-hand side of the track, right-hand side of the track, down to leeward, okay? They all have got, obviously, um, uh, uh, reasons for going towards the land or going away from the land, okay? So all that needs to be taken into consideration on the starting line. So if we want to go left, we know we want to be in the port third of the starting line if we want to be going left. If you want to be going right, you need to be in the starboard third of the starting line so you actually stand a chance of getting to the right, yeah? Whereas obviously the middle of a starting line, perfect for the shifty conditions, yeah? Using the shifts maybe more up the middle of the track, okay? The only big issue, though, as we all know, ladies and gents, and I'm sure you appreciate it, with a longish starting line at any major event, it's all about the transits, yeah, and about being over the line at the start um, uh, or too far away from the line at the start when you cannot get a good transit. So the only time I would recommend anybody starting out of the middle, of the, the middle sector of the line would be if it's shifty conditions and you can get a good transit, yeah? If you can't get a good transit, you're high risk. You don't want to be black flagged or OCS or whatever, whatever. Uh, so, you know, these are the things we need to discuss uh, when we're practicing our starting techniques. <coughs> Next one, uh, tactics. Most certainly, we need to be addressing the issue of tactics, and that is whether it's boat to boat, B to B, or boat to group. Uh, B to G, or B to F, uh, boat to fleet. Now, that, okay, obviously is three separate areas of tactics. I mean, my basic, uh, if you like, advice when it comes to the subject has always been start, i.e. make a good start, yeah? Consolidate that start. Stay between the majority of the opposition and the next mark, and then go on to win. <laughs> <laughs> Having, there's that other saying in there, keep it simple. Yeah? Keep it simple. That's what the game's about. You know, don't overthink it. Keep it simple. Start, consolidate, win. Not necessarily, ladies and gents, the race, not necessarily, but to be finishing in the top ten, you know, the top end of the fleet in each race. How many events have I been to personally, and maybe yourselves, have we been to nowadays where the gold medalist never won a race? Okay? They were just consistently at the sharp end of the fleet. All right? So, yeah, because in my time, you know, working obviously in, on the coaching side, uh, very often I've had people thinking, whoa, you know, uh, very focused. I've got to win this race, you know. Well, maybe, don't get me wrong, that might be the case towards the end if you want the gold medal. But uh, through the week, as the championship opens up, you know, we've just got to be consistently up there and focus on that uh, and not focus on actually winning the race. Just be consistent. Now, don't get me wrong. Do we ever see anybody nowadays at any major event winning every race? No. It doesn't happen anymore. It used to happen, 
you know, back in the 40s, the 50s, whatever, 60s, but not anymore. Everybody's got too good uh, ar around the racetrack. Right, the next one that was in the training program was the racing rules. Now, uh, the few words I'd just like to have about these, uh, in, uh, in the good old days, obviously, when I was with uh, Lord Nelson on HMS Victory at that European Championship back in 1805, there was one racing rule. Luff them and leave them. <laughs> that was it. Today, you've got 93 racing rules to think about. Okay? Um, and as I was saying to Louis earlier on, uh, in my time as a competitor and as a coach, uh, I think it's fair for me to stand here and say that generally speaking, the overall standard and knowledge of the racing rules is pathetic. <laughs> it really is. I mean, uh, you know, and it's not just the same in this country, the UK, it's the same globally. And this is a major area of concern, okay? As and when you go to a national event, a European event, a world event, the Olympic Games, the America's Cup, whatever. They play a major role, okay? Um, and uh, certainly, uh, when I look at that particular topic, the fundamental racing rules, of which there's seven now, but, uh, you know, I, I've often asked people, you know, what are the fundamental racing rules of yacht racing? They can't tell me. You know, and some of these people have been racing for years, okay? Likewise, the definitions, I think there's 22 of those now, You've got to know all 22 definitions before you even start considering reading the rules because the definitions are always there in the written rules, okay? So you need to know what the definition of tacking is. You need to know, you know, all the various points around the racetrack. What does that word actually mean, okay? The definition of. So... In order of the learning curve, for uh, those of you who are racing in the future, obviously, <coughs> you need to address the fundamental rules first, the definitions second, and then move into part two of the racing rules. Now, how many press-ups would you like to do, Lou? <laughs> no problem. Is... <laughs> um, uh, 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 10 to 23, those are the uh, part four, uh, sorry, part two racing rules, which always apply whilst you are racing, yeah? Uh, and they're the ones that you need to focus on uh, and get a grip of. Uh, rule 60, uh, the other one I wanted to just talk about briefly, protesting. Now, I know, and in fact, uh, yeah, I do know, of course I know, otherwise I won't be telling you. Uh, the... Um, number of times uh, I have seen as a competitor and as a coach yeah, a racing rule being infringed or a sailing instruction being infringed okay out there on the water okay and nothing is done about it absolutely nothing okay people don't bother now for me in a way that's a sad state of affairs because what you end up with, if you think about this, is people standing on the podium at the end of any major event, and I know they should not be there. You know, that's cheating, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, they are not supposed to be there. And, um, you know, I, I, I've, unfortunately, I have been to numerous events where that's been the case. And um, likewise, I have also had a scenario uh, where a very good sailor, a very good sailor and a good friend of mine, I was assisting him at uh, a world championship in Weymouth Bay. And we came uh, to a scenario where there was an incident at the Windward Mark and I uh, uh, just happened to, as you would expect, be there with a the video camera. So I had it all um, and uh, got ashore and, uh, oh, shall we bother? you know, lodging this protest, don't really want to do it. Uh, and I said, well, think about this now. If you don't do it, yeah, it could be very costly 
at the end of the week when it comes to the medal ceremony. So I'm very pleased to say that the skipper decided, after my little bit of word in the port and starboard earlobe, yeah, uh, to actually go ahead. We went ahead and we won the protest. And we won that protest, which gained us one point. On the last race of this World Championship, there was a photo finish between two boats, and you're not going to believe this, this is true, between a Ukrainian boat and a Russian boat. Now, that photograph, okay, determined which one of those two was going to get the silver medal. Because our team, having won that protest and gaining one point, won the gold medal. So there's my message, you know, for your future racing, don't have the attitude, or oh, I couldn't be bothered, I'd rather be at the bar having a drink, forget it, yeah? Because it's not fair on the rest of the fleet, your colleagues, fellow competitors, yeah? Uh, we don't want, you know, people winning things that should not be there, you know? They've somewhere along the line broken a sailing instruction or a racing rule. Okay, and then, uh, uh, so protests, yeah. I mean, we don't like it. I know we don't like it. Who does? But it's part of the sport. And uh, I think the other key thing, if I just sum up on that particular point, ladies and gents, is that it's attitudes, people's attitudes towards it. We're not being nasty. If you lodge a protest, you know, you are not being nasty because you're lodging a protest. You've just got a point to make, you know. Somebody has broken a rule. You know, we need to sort it out. And if they won't take their penalty on the water, you know, so be it. It goes to the protest room uh, and it gets sorted out. And then at the end of the championship, you know, everybody's happy with the final results, if you like. Okay. The other one, number 93 there. Any ideas what rule 93 is? As a seasoned group of campaigned racers, always buy the coach a drink. <laughs> This is rule 93. <coughs> okay. Uh, and then um, uh, the final one there, obviously, compass work, uh, orientation uh, of the race area, uh, and obviously uh, for your start, starting line. Um, it's, I mean, how many times again have I seen people go around the windward mark and you can't see the leeward mark, as an example? or the way around, you're at the leeward mark, you can't see the windward mark, okay, because of the waves, the sea state, the background, whatever, whatever. So it's so important to be obviously on the ball with your compass. And uh, to that end, I'll never forget Keel Week one year, uh, I was at the top mark, it was the 420 class, we were there for a training week uh, in Germany, and um, one of my ferrets came around the windward mark, it was a young lady, and she saw me there in the coach boat, yeah, and she shouts across the water to me, Jim, which way do I go now? <laughs> and I'm pulling my hair out, as, as you would, you know what I mean? So, compass bearings. If you can't see the mark, at least you've got a compass, and you know what the bearing is for the next leg, yeah? Get going, and then w uh, worry about seeing it further, further on down the track. Right, uh, so yeah, and then the final one there, uh, meteorology. Um, yeah, we need to about the weather. I mean, uh, nowadays, I think it's fair to say, even in my time uh, as a coach, we always had the latest knowledge about the weather, uh, the wind direction, the wind speed, uh, what it was likely to do during the course of the racing period, yeah. Uh, we knew all about low pressures, high pressures, weather fronts, uh, what to look for in the clouds, okay, um, you know, uh, uh, and all this information is there, stored in the memory bank, 30 press-ups have been late, in the memory banks, <laughs> uh, in the memory banks, uh, so that you've got a good idea, yeah, uh, obviously as to uh, what to expect from the weather and, and which way to go. Now, that program, uh, as I say, was developed a long time ago, and as far as I'm concerned, it stands to this very day, and it will not change in my eyes, uh, because 
I'm a great believer in that magic phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay? Uh, and this is what we did in 1805 for Horatio in my dreams. And what we certainly did when I get to the next part of my holiday, uh, when it comes to the Royal Yachting Association. Okay. Now, having said that, Navy days obviously went on. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, I ended up in the job as the Royal Navy sailing coach for two years, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I took over from a guy, some of you may remember him, uh, Roy Mullander, uh, was the Royal Navy coach prior to me. And he made a name for himself, obviously, with the Fastnet races and the uh, round the world, uh, early, early races of the round the world. Uh, great guy, sadly no longer with us, but um, uh, I took over from him. Now, in that role, um, towards the end of my time uh, in that job, uh, which was about 1976, uh, that uh, period of time, 73 to 76, <coughs> I had to organize um, a racing or uh, a sailing coaches course for the Royal Navy, which had to be assessed by the Royal Yachting Association. And some of you may remember the name, famous name as far as I'm concerned, Bob Bond. Now, Bob, at the time, uh, 1976, uh, uh, and maybe a bit before that, uh, was the then the RYA National Training uh, Manager, the National Sailing Coach. And he had uh, uh, set up and was already running a very successful national sailing scheme, sail training scheme. And what the RYA had decided to do uh, was to run parallel with that a national race training scheme. Because the, the, the RYA at that time, and we're talking now early 70s, uh, after the uh, uh, Olympic Games, the yachting in Kiel, obviously, in Germany in 72, uh, they decided, they looked at the big picture. The RYA committee looked at the big overall picture globally. And where is Great Britain in the sport globally? Now, we had Ronnie Patterson, of course we did, doing well with the Flying Dutchman. We had John O'Clear around, and, and you know, lots of good sailors, don't get me wrong. But, you know, th there was nothing there like blanketing the racing scene. So the RYA, uh, uh, in their wisdom, decided to start this RYA race training scheme. And it was whilst I was working with Bob on the Royal Navy coaches uh, course that he actually said to me at the end of that week, um, he said, would I be interested in a new appointment, a brand new appointment at the RYA as the uh, RYA national racing coach? And, I, and obviously I said to him, yeah, I'd be very interested, very keen to do that job. And, um, and that was it. And then I, I got an invite, um, obviously, uh, to me on, on the ship I was serving on at the time uh, to go to Woking, uh, the RYA head office at that time, where, believe it or not, there was 11 people. Uh, only 11 people were on the staff of the RYA uh, back in 1976, 77. But when I left the RYA after the Sydney Olympics, there was 86 people on the staff. It, it had become the largest governing body of sport in the UK by a long way. It was massive. It still is. It's amazing how many people are there now. Uh, and great, you know, it means that the sport is in a healthy state, so to speak, in the UK. Anyway, so uh, I went for the interview at Woking. Um, went into the interview, and to be quite honest with you, as I would be, I thought I came across in the interview pretty badly. You know, it's just one of those interviews. Because I, I don't suppose I it's fair to say maybe the first interview I'd ever done for a job. Uh, as the, you didn't need to do an interview to join the Royal Navy, you were just told to get in the Navy. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, I, I thought I came across pretty badly. And I, I left Woking and uh, went back to my ship, which at the time was HMS Hermione, and we were serving with the US Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean, based in Naples. And um, a signal came, obviously, to the ship, saying, you've got the job. 
and I thought, oh my God, you know, as you do, as you would. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I thought, well, oh, subject, by the way, he continued to say, subject to leaving the Royal Navy within six months. Well, no way. Uh, in those days, you had to give 18 months notice to leave the forces. So I thought that was me out of it straight away. And, uh, you know, and I said this to my divisional officer. I said, well, no way. Anyway, cut a short story long, as I do. Um, the then Secretary General of the RYA was a man by the name of John Jury. And he was a close friend of Admiral Sir David Williams, the flag officer of Portsmouth. And I knew Admiral Williams obviously quite well because I was in the Navy sailing team for 12 years. And those two got their heads together and all of a sudden, this was during the fleet review now actually, uh, but when this happened at uh, the, uh, the Silver Jubilee fleet review in the Solent, we were anchored in, in the line. And um, uh, the message came on board Hermione, Salt and stall, off. <laughs> and, and so they gave me a good send off. Re my wife recalls seeing me coming up the gangway off the Gosport ferry with no shoes on. So, <laughs> so I, I got a good send off from the Navy. And anyway, so uh, obviously uh, uh, I joined the RYA. And um, when I actually left the Navy, I'll never forget this little story as well because it still sticks out in my mind. I was in uh, Victory Barracks in Portsmouth, you know, going through the uh, process of leaving. And the master at arms said to me, he said, Salt and Stall. I said, yes, master. He says, I personally have never known anybody leave the Royal Navy legally as fast as you've done, except for Prince Philip when he married the Queen. <laughs> and I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, and uh, anyway, so I left. And I went to the RYA, and uh, the brief was quite simply this. It was, it was a short, sweet brief, really. The brief was, from the RYA, your job is to raise the standards of racing in the United Kingdom. Full stop. <coughs> there was a couple of little extras, but that's the main key thing. And anyway, uh, so I thought, right, fine, okay. How the hell am I going to do this? Well, the obvious answer, you had to start with the youth. The youth of then, 1976-77. And when I say youth, I'm talking about optimist class and above. So we established uh, the RYA Youth Race Training Scheme. At the bottom was the optimist that moved up into the cadet, the mirror, uh, that moved up into the laser, 420. You know, it was a progression uh, through the youth classes. And uh, obviously from that, uh, we built the network. And we had to have a very wide base. And so the way we approached it was, we held a, a meeting in London at, at the International Boat Show, invited all racing club commod commodores to come to the meeting, to explain to the racing clubs of the UK what we were going to do. And uh, whether they wanted to be on board with the programme or not. Well, obviously, I'm pleased to say the majority went for it. Uh, they became part of it and started, obviously, race training in the clubs for the office, mirrors, cadets, toppers, uh, 420s. And then, okay, obviously, that uh, developed. Um, and we had then, it got so popular, we had to nominate 12 regional race training coordinators uh, for each region of the RYA, establish a coordinator to organize the training in the regions. And then from that, uh, obviously, the youngsters who came out top of the, you know, sailing in the club uh, were then being recommended to come to a national youth uh, race training week which we held the very first one, myself and Eric Twynham, God bless him, we ran the very first pilot scheme youth course at Queen Mary Sailing Club. Um, and that was the first ever RYA Youth Race Training Week. <coughs> the other thing in the brief was, you've got five years, only five years, to come up with results. Because after five years, the whole program will be reviewed 
and a decision made as to whether or not to carry on with this program or scrap it. Okay. So I thought, well, it's fair enough. Five years is sort of doable, just, uh, when you're starting from nothing. And so the scheme ran on. Myself and John Barker, some of you may not know the name, but he was a very high-profile person in the RYA, Youth Training, Youth Racing Committee. He was the chairman. He and I went to Quiberon in France to the World Youth Championships, and we observed the British team's performance rubbish. They finished 16th and 17th in the two classes in a fleet of 20 boats in each class. So I wasn't impressed, needless to say, and neither was the chairman of the race training committee. And we actually, I recall us down in the marina saying to each other, this ain't going to happen again. And it didn't. Because we went back home and got on with the training with the help of the clubs uh, and obviously uh, various other people al along the line. So then uh, 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 what, what happened eventually in the end was the next World Youth Championship, 78, was in Lake Como in Italy, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83. 83, because it, uh, it was in New Zealand. It was the end of 83, early 84. <coughs> we struck gold. We won the World Youth Championships in the fifth year of the program. Jason Belbin and Andy Hemmings, God bless them, took the gold medal in the 470 class. Stuart Childerley, he uh, uh, finished fourth, okay, but a first and a fourth meant that we actually won the World Youth. Uh, and so came back home, obviously, flew from Auckland back to London, at the end of which the RYA, because it was the end of the fifth year, said, Fantastic news, carry on with the program. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, because from that, uh, I guess the next thing for me was the World uh, Youth Championships in 84, uh, where again, uh, Stuart Childerley uh, took gold medal in the laser in San Diego. And uh, what really pleased me about that gold medal, because we went to watch the Olympic sailing regatta first, in San Francisco, and then drop down to San Diego. Uh, you know, it's all about educating the youngsters about the Olympic Games, yeah? So they witnessed the Olympic sailing. We then went down to uh, San Diego for the Youth Worlds. Stuart won the gold. But what really pleased me about it, and I'm quite, you know, it's, it's still emotional in a way to this very day, he was presented with his gold medal in the San Diego Yacht Club by Dennis Connors. And that was a great moment for Stuart Chauvely. You know, it was a really good moment because he obviously adored the man uh, from the America's Cup. And anyway, in 2003, at the actual World Championships, Stuart won the gold medal. Dennis was fifth or sixth. <laughs> and I said to Dennis at the event, I said, Dennis, do you remember this young lad? He says, I, I bloody well do. <laughs> you know, and he, he just uh, won the actual world uh, title. Um, and, and Dennis Connors was in the fleet. So, yeah, all these little things stick out in your memory. Uh, then in 85, Andy Beesworth uh, won the gold medal, youth gold medal in uh, San Moritz, Switzerland, on the lake. And then the next big one, and this is where it was now really changing, shifting gears, so to speak, 1995, World Youth Championships, Bermuda. Three golds, two silver. World Youth Championships, absolutely wiped the rest of the world. And uh, it was a good party afterwards, I can assure you. Um, and then, obviously, when we came back from Bermuda with three golds, two silver, uh, that, to me, was uh, maybe the, the climax of the youth program, really, that we'd gone from 1977 through to 95, and there we were, um, with all the medals hanging around our necks. And then, uh, obviously, the following year, 96, which was, again, another moment in time for British sailing. Two silver medals. John Merricks, God bless him, and Ian Walker. And um, uh, the other one went to uh, 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 an angel. Uh, <laughs> uh, went to Ben, silver medal. And uh, having won, obviously, his youth gold medal in Bermuda the year before. So that was fantastic. A 19-year-old lad had gone to the Games, 
got the silver medal and he was so close to winning the gold even then. Now, as you know, we went on to Sydney next and did it anyway. But um, uh, for me, uh, that 1995 team, uh, you know, uh, were the team that really uh, were strong and we knew that British sailing was now going to be up there with the rest of the world, either at youth events or any other event. So we ruled, uh, obviously ruled out of there. 96, as I say, two silver medals. Now those two silver medals, ladies and gents, believe it or not, were two of only four medals won by the whole of Team GB at that Olympic Games. And, you know, it's the worst games, results-wise, that uh, uh, Team GB, I think, has ever had. And two of the medals were sailing. Silver, two silvers. I'll never forget, as you do at these things, at the uh, party at the end, uh, obviously, of the, uh, uh, the event, uh, Sir Craig Reedy uh, came, flew from Atlanta to Savannah, because obviously all the sailing was in Savannah. And he came and, and he took the whole sailing team, all 16 of us, uh, out for dinner, which was fantastic, obviously. And he put his card on the table at the end to pay for the dinner. And I was sat on his port side, and as he nudged my shoulder, he said, he, I just said to me, I'll never forget the quote, thank God you lot did all right. <laughs> and that sticks out in my memory, obviously, as it would. Uh, but then, what happened after that, of course, we came home after the Atlanta Games in the August-September time. And uh, what happened thereafter was, in later that year, all of a sudden, lottery funding had obviously started to go through the roof for British sport. And the budget, the RYA budget for race training during my time from, obviously, 1977 through to um, uh, 1996, yeah, was as near as, damn it, give or take a few pennies, about £60,000 per annum, that neck of the woods. Telephone call, message, whatever, to the boss of the RYA, £2.3 million. Now, that was because of two silver medals in Savannah at the Atlanta Olympic Games. All of a sudden, we had so much money, we didn't know what to do with it. So that created, obviously, a moment, another moment in time of uh, restructuring to spend all that money. And Rod Carr came uh, to the RYA uh, from the U UKSA uh, at Cowes, and he had become already the Olympic team manager, Olympic coach um, in 1980. He took over from Peter Bateman, another good, very good friend of mine. Uh, Peter was in the job, Olympic team coach for the Moscow Olympics, which, as we all know, never happened. And anyway, uh, Rod Carr took that rule on because, obviously, for me personally, at that time, I was doing Olympics, youth, women's training. You know, there was just too much going on. So we had to spread the load. And Rod put a very good team together, obviously, for the year 2000, the Sydney Games. And the money was spent on the following key things. Number one, all our boats left Tilbury docks in refrigerated containers. Think about it. How much would that have cost? A lot of money to go from London to Sydney in a refrigerated container. You could not send boats in a container halfway around the world. They would have melted, okay, with the heat, obviously, uh, crossing the tropics, yeah, Cancer, Capricorn, Equator. So that was money well spent. We had our own boats in perfect condition in Sydney. The next big spend was private accommodation right next to the marina, whereas all the other teams had to go to the Olympic Village, which was 45 minutes boat trip up the river. We didn't want that. You know, every morning, every evening, you know what I mean? What a waste of time. And uh, just mentally draining you, really. Uh, whereas you've got your own private accommodation on site. And that cost a lot of money, obviously. Uh, so, but it turned out to be money, again, well spent. Three gold medals, two silver medals. Top team, top sailing team in the Olympic Games. And not only that, top sports team, top GB team was sailing. We won the most medals uh, in Sydney. So 
it was all money that was well spent, um, you know, in the right areas to achieve the result. So uh, that uh, obviously ruled on. Uh, uh, I then, in fact, at the, it was after that games, uh, Sydney 2000, at the medal ceremony, which was in the Opera House. Uh, I actually sat on the steps of the Opera House afterwards, and uh, somebody trying to sneak in. Uh, <laughs> in the Opera House, and uh, cut a short story long again, as I do. <laughs> Are you coming in to do press-ups, you lot? <laughs> uh, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I was on, on the steps, and uh, I just sat down, as you do, took a few moments of time out, if you like, a few seconds, and I sat on the Opera House steps, and I said to myself, do you know, Jim, the last 23 years has been worth it because that's how long it took, 77 to 2000, to end up three gold, two silver, top team in the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I thought, it's all been worth it. It's all been great, fantastic. You know, that's another 15 years of my life holiday put behind me, uh, so, sorry, so to speak, uh, 23 years, not 15 and then, uh, obviously, got back to the UK, and uh, I left the RYA. Uh, and I, I left, and to be very honest with you, which I am, uh, not out of choice. I, I actually wanted to stay. But the, the restructuring to handle all this money uh, was to be spent on desk jobs, you know, uh, uh, laundering the money, so to speak, into the right areas, yeah? so that we could do the same in 2004, which we did, as you all know. Same team, more or less, went on and uh, won the medals. And then again in 2008, 2012, all the same ferrets, more or less. And uh, you know, it, it was great. But I was put in that position uh, uh, where if I wanted to stay on the staff of the RYA, there was no more coaches, full-time paid staff. In other words, if they wanted a coach for any class, and quite rightly so, they'd contract them in. So you've got a, a coach for each class, yeah, uh, to get ready for 2004 and beyond. Uh, and that's how the money was being spent. Uh, so I left, and then uh, from that, obviously, I became, I was outside. Um, I was on my own, and uh, my wife was saying to me, and I was saying to my wife, as you do, Hang on a minute, I'm unemployed, I'm redundant, I'm whatever. Uh, I wasn't actually made redundant, that's wrong. Um, you know, I was actually, uh, uh, because of the restructuring, I didn't want the job that they were offering me. Uh, and so, uh, I left. But what happened next was, it was very good, really. All of a sudden, the word got about the fact that I was on, you know, unemployed, in inverted commas, and looking for work. Well, the phone never stopped ringing. I was going here, I was going there, I was going there, I was going, there, I was going everywhere, um, all over the world. And that was primarily um, with the actual program, um, doing three or four, yeah, four, maybe even five actual worlds with Stuart and Andy Beesworth, uh, the Dragon Worlds with Klaus and Grant and um, uh, Andy Beesworth again did a few, few of those world championships. Uh, the 420 class association we were running international seminars in canada japan australia south africa south america we were all over the world uh, running race training seminars and the final big program for me was the tp52 uh, spent five years on the tp52 program with a guy called john cook great guy uh, and he uh, owned a boat by the name of Christabella. And I had five great years with him. He was an owner driver, uh, not a professional. And he really obviously enjoyed that type of racing in, in, in the TP52. And in fact, on one occasion, I'll never forget, God bless him, because he's no longer with us. He had to come in between races. He had to jump into the coach boat because he smoked. And the team would not allow him to smoke on his own boat. <laughs> so, between races, he used to hop into the rib and we'd have a chat about it. And he always used to call me Yorkshire. And he said, uh, hey, Yorkshire, how did I do in that race? 
and I'd, we'd discuss, uh, discuss the key points, you know, as regards the start and uh, which way he went and, you know, mark rounding and boat handling and all that sort of thing. And he said, anyway, he said, Yorkshire, I've had a great time today. He says, I've had the, one of the best days you could ever wish for. And I said, well, why was that then, John? He says, I went round the Windward Mark in front of Ben Ainsley. <laughs> <coughs> And, and that made his regatta. You know, just by doing that, uh, it, it was that type of bloke. And he was just, a, as I say, an ornery, ornery guy who had no asp uh, aspirations of being a professional helmsman or anything like that. And yet, of course, a lot of the other boats were full of pros. You know, uh, these guys who were being paid to do it, uh, so to speak. But anyway, those, those were the good days. Right, so... Uh, uh, that was then me, uh, obviously, that was right up to 2016. Uh, so I had that 16 pe uh, year period there of uh, <coughs> working as a freelance professional coach. Thoroughly enjoyed it all, met some fantastic sailors, and had the, you know, I was very fortunate to work with a lot of good talent, especially with the RYA youth program. You know, these youngsters, when they started with me, were you know, 12 years old, 12, 13. And I still see them to this very day, yeah, and uh, socialize with them. Uh, and uh, some of these guys are now in their 50s. Yeah, and I'm still, you know, talking with them and <laughs> meeting them. <laughs> um, and uh, it's great to see them all and, and obviously catch up on the good times. Um, and uh, also, uh, racing rules-wise, um, what I've done for you is I've actually, uh, we, we'll pass them out in a minute, not yet, I've done it just like a, an A4 sheet for you. Do you uh, actually appreciate that there are 17 occasions when you're out there racing and you're on port tank where you've got the right of way? Now, you know, I know for a fact that maybe you know, the ma minority of people before me this evening might think of four or five or six or seven, yeah? Uh, but there's 17. And so I've done a little printout of what they are uh, to <laughs> hand out to you all this evening. Uh, just as a guide. Don't get me wrong. So you can look at it and read it and do what you, what you like with it. But there are. It's amazing how many times, you know. And in fact, going back to a, a comment Louis made earlier on, by knowing the racing rules well, You've got the advantage, mark my words, because you are now a chess player and you are forward thinking all the moves. You know what moves are going to be made in the starting area. You know what moves are going to happen on the first beat. You know what moves are going to happen at the windward mark. You know what moves are going to happen on the downwind leg, especially when it comes to a gate as a leeward mark, yeah? When you've got two marks in the water. You know, all these manoeuvres... Tactically, the tactician needs to know when he's on port tack, am I right or am I wrong? And uh, over the years, we have, and don't get me wrong, there's been lots of discussion with judges, umpires, judges, yeah, uh, about, oh, hang on, are you sure about this now? And you actually read the wording of the rule, yeah, and as an example, I, I have read, obviously, I, I knew the book inside out when I was in the job, and back to front and upside down. There are phrases or sentences or full stops or commas where you think, oh, hang on a minute. Are you sure that's right? And my answer is, of course, in Yorkshire, it's right. <laughs> in Hampshire, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this was my sort of approach. Well, you know, it, it really, uh, as a piece of paper, it's just a discussion point for you as a skipper or you as a, a tactician to just think about when you're out there on that racetrack. I'm on Port Tech. What are my rights here? Any or none, yeah? Uh, and it's food for thought, if you like. A bit of uh, <coughs> uh, home reading during the winter months uh, before you start racing again next year. Okay. Right. Um, I think that's about all I've got to say as regards my life in a blue suit, uh, ladies and gents. Um, I've obviously got some copies of it here if anybody's interested. Uh, and I um, obviously would just like to take this opportunity 
in wishing you all uh, great, great success in your future racing, uh, obviously, and I hope that you have a successful uh, 2024 out there on the water. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, that was superb time over distance. <laughs> you hit one hour, like, I think you were about five seconds out, Jim. <laughs> well, that's 20 pesos. <laughs> Can I pass you those to pass yeah. backwards? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And Grab I don't me. think there's quite enough for everybody. Uh -huh. So hold on to that if you get one. I'll, I'll get it printed downstairs. Can you sign this as well? <laughs> yeah. Is it over the book? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> now you're talking. Yeah. 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 And uh, sorry, anybody, any questions? Any thoughts about what's been going on since 1977? <laughs> um, obviously, I, I've had the pleasure to sail with many a person you've been involved with. Um, and it's been a great pleasure because they've always been so professional and wonderful. Uh, Lord Nelson looks down upon us, you know, so it's like you it, it were literally speaking to us, which is lovely to see. So um, I suppose the question I would ask is, you know, obviously you've worked with a lot of coaches, other coaches at oh, the yeah. time, you know, and what have some of the most enjoyable experiences been in that time with working with other coaches? And, uh -huh. you know, is there any ones that stand out? Uh, yeah, all of them. <laughs> Excuse me. All, uh, all the parties at the end. <laughs> you know, because th here's the thought, ladies and gents. Again, because this is an area, if you like, where I am a little bit concerned. In, in my time as, as a racing couch, I, my philosophy has always been work hard, play hard. That's been my philosophy. Rightly or wrongly, you work hard. You stand on the podium, podium, you pick up a medal, it is now party time. Well, I think I've got the hang of that. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the rubbed off from something. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's all about fun, yeah? yeah. Sailing is fun. Uh, because I do hear things from not just this country, but elsewhere in the world. It's all work and no play. Mm. And I think that's a bit sad. Yeah, I think you've got to uh, work hard and play hard. Have a, what's life all about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, have a good time. Yes, sir. I, I, I don't have a question, but I've got a comment yeah. I'm making, which I am appalled that you missed out the highlight of your career, which was coaching me in my boat right. in, 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 in 2005 when I got a boat and a terrible team. Actually, I didn't really have a team. I couldn't get a team. And my strategy was to hire you to help us to get into the Commodore's Cup. And you turned us from an absolutely trash team, and we did get in the, the Commodore's Cup. And it was Great. a fantastic year, and I want to thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. But the thing that stood out for me, which I'd like to, to say, is there are some people in life who, who take complicated things, or take simple things and make them complicated. Yeah. And I think you did the reverse, and I think that's the magic that I experienced when you coached us. Uh -huh. You could take complicated things like a difficult mark rounding. Yeah, yeah. And, and boil it down to something very, very simple that even I, in my crew, could understand. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought that was fantastic. So thank you very much indeed. No, you know, you're welcome. And it's, and it's good to see you again. <laughs> All that, next time you're out there performing, make sure you follow those port tank <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, in fact, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the other things uh, which really I'm not, I haven't mentioned, but. Uh, as regards my life in a blue suit, I mean, highlights-wise, yeah, I suppose those Olympic Games, well, the World Youth, obviously, the first World Youth, 83, and then uh, again in 84, 85, 95, all highlights for me personally. <coughs> and then um, the Olympic Games topped it all, so to speak. But uh, also, uh, I was very, very lucky and very honoured uh, to shake Betty's hand and pick up an MBE. That was another highlight in my lifetime. Uh, Yachtsman of the Year, 84 and 95, two more highlights through coaching. And last year, getting the Lifetime Achievement Award. So it makes me stand here and say to you as a group of racing people, it's the most challenging sport in the world. Please remind me what's second. What is the second most challenging sport in the world? Formula One motor racing. 
And what is third bronze medal, please? Equestrian, working with the horses. They are your top three most challenging sports in the world. Sailing is number one. Where are you? Yeah, there you go. Sorry, yes, sir. I'm, I'm just wondering what your view is of the way the racing rules have evolved over, over the years. Uh -huh. um, now, I'm, I'm also a great, a great believer. <coughs> Got to see on the camera. Shows all the creases. Um, but uh, keep it simple. Now, over the years, as we all know, they've got more difficult. Um, and you know, when it comes to uh, actually appeal cases and breaking down scenarios, situations, yes, uh, they have in areas become more complicated. But having made that statement, <laughs> I think that was more in like the 70s, the 80s, 90s, that neck of the woods. I, uh, reading the rule book more recently, you know, for occasions like this, I do think now that they are beginning to make more sense. As long as you read the definitions. You understand the definitions of the racing rules, yeah? And it makes it easier uh, that way. Yes, young man. What's, what's your view on the Mercury's Cup at the moment? How that goes uh -huh. for in boats and on the team? It's very different, isn't it? Very different. I mean, I remember, you know, obviously when I was on HMS Victory. More like that then. Uh, but, um, you know, obviously technology, you know. The sport moves on. And to watch it on the TV is very exciting. No doubt about it. You know, and the speeds these guys are doing around a racetrack, you don't want to crash, do you? I mean, it's uh, horrendous. Um, so technology obviously has changed the game. Um, in some people's eyes, not, not for the better. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people who prefer to see the America's Cup, for example, uh, back in a monohull, you know, and... Uh, but then again, would it be as exciting as it is now uh, flying around doing 40 knots? You know, so, yeah, it's uh, like foiling it. I was only talking to Louie earlier on about in the Olympic Games. If you want to see foiling in the Olympic Games, put the international moth in there. You know, great class, you know, for, for foiling. And it would be, it'd be a spectacle uh, uh, for spectators to watch them going around a racetrack as a single-handed foiler, yeah? But anyway, uh, uh, you know, as I say, time's moved on. Time waits for nobody. Any more for any more? Yes, young man. I would just like to say thank you very much. You're welcome. I was one of those cadets in 84, 5 at Rutland. How many press-ups did you do? <laughs> Several, because I was an Indian and I was cold. And <laughs> didn't think I was terribly <laughs> motivated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when we went out of the gate, this year in the fast now. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was blowing a bit. And my crew, my entire crew of foils went down the seat at me. Yeah. And I was on my quad for two or three hours mm. yeah. driving the boat, heaving in and in, which yeah, yeah. a monster. Uh -huh. <laughs> I thought back to Rutland Water in 85, and you said, just don't hit the ice because you go around the Woodland Park. <laughs> 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 and you've been, you've been there since 85 always, just, just reminding me. Great. Right. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. No, no, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you've enjoyed your racing career. Mm -hmm. All right. Long may it continue. <laughs> yes, sir. Sorry. Um, thank you. Did two questions. Yeah. Uh, first, what makes a good coach? And oh. second, do you just have a blue sheet or do you have a different coach? Uh, yeah, it's blue. That's all I've got. <laughs> uh, well, coach wise, um, Maybe a, a bit of a difficult uh, question to answer that, but I suppose to be a good teacher, anybody, I don't care what sport it is, or if you're a teacher at school, yeah, uh, or a sports coach, it's all about knowledge of subject. You've got to know what you're talking about, and you've got to get it across to the people that you're working with. And they've got to believe you and understand and take it on board. And, you know, if you say, you know, I want you to do 10 tacks up the beat, they do 10 tacks up the beat, you know, and then ask why afterwards, you know. Uh, you know and, and that's the, um, the way you've got to be thinking. You've got to be positive. 
Positive thinking, as we all know in this room, brings positive results. Negative thinking brings negative results. So we're always positive thinking. Don't know the word negative, never mentioned uh, when you're in the coaching mode, you know what I mean? Um, and then, yeah, okay, I was lucky. Uh, I came straight into sailing from being born. I was christened in the Royal Yorkshire Yacht Club with a soda siphon from behind the bar <laughs> and taken to, down onto a Yorkshire One design and that was my first day out sailing. You know, I was only a, a couple of months old and but never looked back. And it's all the knowledge I gained, you know, in Bridlington Bay, uh, in the Royal Navy, that enabled me to then come to the RYA and, and pass it on to others, yeah? That's what it's all about, knowledge of subject. Yes, love. Have you been uh, challenged by your pupils? So that means, uh, no, no, they're too frightened. <laughs> no, no, in the sense that... Uh, no, 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 in the sense yes. uh, that uh, they uh, uh, made you think in a different way. That is, yeah. you learn from yes. them. Yes, oh yeah. Very good, uh, valid point, uh, I think, uh, ladies and gents. <coughs> I learned, seriously now, I mean this, I learned a lot by watching you know, what other people do. Uh, and in fact, Keel Week, for me, we did 16 Keel Weeks in a row with the youth squad. And one race for every squad for 16 years, one race, they had to come with me in the coach boat and watch it. Because you'll be amazed how much you learn by watching a race, yeah? Uh, and that's what we did in training. You know, they, they, they came and watched a race, at least one, uh, to learn from it, yeah? And then what, what they learned, obviously, um, and I've been seeing as a coach, I've seen many things happen at sea as a coach, where I then thought, oh, I must put that into our training program, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, we're learning all the time. I, I'm, okay, I mean, uh, you know, I'm 76 now, but to this very day, I am still learning. You never stop learning, especially in the most challenging sport in the world, because it's changing all the time, yeah? Thanks very much, Louis, for having me well, aboard. I think, Jim, a, a glass of red wine. <laughs> Thank you very much.